um, RG flows in six dimensions uh, based on work with uh, Tom Revilles and Alessandro Tomasiello. And then uh, also on 4D flows uh, in uh, Fabio Cruzzi, Paul Kostler, Kessler, and uh, Thomas Roche, uh, some of who are in the audience. Uh, and I'll just emphasize the wonderful job these guys did. Uh, so let me begin with the flow of the talk. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm first going to talk about, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, for people who uh, you know what I'm talking about when I say RG flow, what I mean by an RG flow in a general sense. Uh, then I'll introduce what I mean by uh, T-brains in the context of uh, F theory and why they appear to be relevant for RG flows. And then I'll come to talk about uh, applying these ideas in the context of RG flows for particular kinds of six-dimensional theories. Um, and then I'll apply it again in the context of four-dimensional flows. And what's interesting here is that there's aspects of the mathematical structure which are quite similar for both 6D flows and for 4D flows. Uh, but on the other hand, when we look at what's happening in the F theory geometry, it leads to uh, very different uh, structures, uh, which is also quite exciting. <coughs> then I'll conclude. OK, so RG flows, what are these? Uh, so it's perhaps best to think about it in terms of some examples. Um, the essential idea is that when we're doing physics, we essentially organize the physics by corresponding length scales or energy scales. And so, for example, if I want to know about uh, riding a water wave, like surfing on a wave, I don't need to know about all the details about things going on very, very short distances, for example, what's happening in water molecules. Um, so we have very different <coughs> descriptions of what's happening at short distances versus uh, long distances. This is essentially uh, what our G flow is doing for you, is providing kind of a formal way to organize your physics according to scales. So for example, I'm walking around, I don't need to talk about all the molecules in my body, but if I wanted to go to shorter distances, I would talk about the molecules in my body. If I wanted to go to even shorter distances, I would talk about inside of those molecules, say, nucleus and so on. And even shorter distances, things like the quarks or the gluons inside of those. Uh, so again, the idea is to go from short distances to long distances. <clears throat> And in the context of uh, quantum field theories, the idea is, again, to talk about going from short to long. And this is often referred to as going from kind of ultraviolet, namely high frequency uh, physics, down to uh, long distance effect, infrared. And this has a very long history in physics. Um, I'm not going to try and emphasize all the uh, references here, but this is the rough uh, idea. So what you can also consider is possible ways of flowing from one place to another. So there could be lots of lots of different ways of going from one short distance description, depending if you perturb it a little bit at short distances, you could wind up with wildly different looking long distance physical phenomena. So there could be many different ways of starting with one short distance thing, tapping it, perturbing the description in a little way, and then at long distances, different descriptions might emerge. There could be a whole network of different flows. Now, there's something interesting that can happen, which is that as you're doing these flows, they're governed by differential equations. Um, it could happen that your differential equations have nice terminal uh, fixed points. So these are what we uh, call fixed points, and, <clears throat> and they have limiting cases in which all the length scales of the problem have either gone to zero or infinity. So uh, correspondingly, the mass scales are either all zero or infinite. <clears throat> and in that sense, there are no scales at all. So these are a very special case, namely the kind of extreme example, where the uh, flows have terminated at some fixed uh, place. And you can actually count what's happening with kind of degrees of freedom leaving your description as you go down. So for example, in even dimensional quantum field theories, you can count things via what are called anomalies. And in three and five dimensions, you can count via a partition function or a behavioral partition function. Um, I'm not going to get too much into detail of the definitions of these. Um, but there is a notion of saying that you've lost degrees of freedom as you go down. For example, you have lots and lots of water molecules, but somehow by the end, we're just talking about, say, one wave. So all of the data of all those individual molecules has been washed out. OK. So an ambitious question is, if we really view each of these little dots as a fixed point, and we imagine perturbing away from that fixed point by changing the boundary conditions of uh, our flow from short to long distances, could we try and classify the entire network of possibilities in going from short distances to uh, long distances? <coughs> So the stringy strategy, uh, so now let's get to some, uh, string theory. Uh, how would we do this? What we're going to be trying to do is engineer examples of those fixed points using the internal geometry of string theory. And we're going to call these, we're going to always have supersymmetry. Uh, these are called superconformal field theories. It's conformal field theory in the sense that it's all involving conformal geometry in the uncompactified directions. There are no length scales, only kind of angles, if you like. 
And it's super because we're always going to impose a, a technical condition of supersymmetry. So in terms of what we're doing in the internal geometry, we're always demanding that all of the internal volumes have either grown to zero or infinity. So everything is either collapsed to zero size or expanded out to infinite size. Okay. How does this come about in F theory? Uh, well, so recall that in F theory, uh, what we have is uh, we'll always have an elliptically fibered Calabria fiber fourfold or threefold. Um, so we have some Calabria threefold, and it has some base. Um, <coughs> so this will be some. And in the context I will be talking about, I will actually allow myself to talk about uh, non-compact bases, and therefore the Calabria will also be uh, non-compact. This should be good enough because we're going to be taking all the distances to be zero and infinite anyway, so we're just going to take the volume of the base to be normally infinite. <clears throat> okay, so there's also something else you can do in terms of trying to engineer uh, these kind of fixed points in F theory, which is you can include uh, non-geometric things that sit at points of the geometric, namely the D3 rings. Okay, so I want to give you an example of this. So examples of 60 CFTs. Here I'm drawing kind of one of these bases. Kind of generic points, uh, you just have some elliptic curve over components of the discriminant locus for the virus stress model. The curve degenerates and becomes singular. And then over coll collisions, uh, things can become even more singular. So examples of this are things that look like they have non cadira fiber types at collisions of two components. So generic values of V, uh, but along U equals zero, we see an E8. And correspondingly for V equals zero, we also see an E8. And you can play this game where you have, for example, intersections of things like this. These are examples that will actually produce uh, uh, CFTs. The reason these occur is because at this collision point, you start doing blobs in the base. And then after doing those blobs in the base, uh, you will get the uh, corresponding OK. So in terms of six-dimensional uh, flows, uh, the first thing we need to do is find all of the fixed points. Then we need to find all of the deformations between those fixed points. So uh, the first question is, can you find all of the canonical singularities for elliptic Calabria three points? The condition we want in order to kind of collapse things down is we're looking basically for canonical singularities inside of non-compact elliptically fibered Calabria uh, three points. In the case of six dimensional theories, <clears throat> there's two kinds of deformations you can then consider. One is associated with Kähler deformations of the base. That's where you take some of the curves in the base and look at them on the finite size, and then when you go to another CFT, you flow all the way to infinite size for that. Uh, and another way you can kind of deform the original theory is by starting with uh, the Calabria and then performing a smoothing deformation or a complex structure deformation. So both of these are allowed, and both of these have uh, physical interpretations in the uh, six dimensional theory. So again, the idea is for making a six D CFT at least. The condition we're looking for is a canonical singularity. Uh, a Calabria threefold with a elliptic Calabria threefold with a canonical singularity. And then from that, we can do either Kähler or complex deformations to get to a somewhat less singular uh, Calabria. So this is our original fixed point, and then after doing this deformation, we can wind up with other Calabrias which themselves may have canonical singularity. And so the ambitious goal is to first off find all the canonical singularities, and then second off find out all the possible ways of deforming between those canonical singularities. Four dimensions, uh, you don't talk about Calabria threefolds. Instead, of you talk about uh, uh, Calabria fourfolds and things related to those. Um, the full ways of generating uh, four dimensional CFTs is still uh, unknown. Uh, so, mainly what we have is a lot of examples and some structural results for those examples. Um, and in this talk, what I'm actually going to do is, in some sense, the most conservative thing. I'm just going to ask what of the uh, structures we can already identify very cleanly in six dimensions kind of survives in the context of four dimension. Uh, okay. So that's at least uh, the starting point. We're going to imagine our RG flows. Remember, these are going from short to long distances. In the context of having fixed points, what we're talking about is having canonical singularities. And when we're talking about RG flows and going from short to long distances, or imagining deforming from some bad singularity to something which is uh, less singular as we uh, flow out. So in other words, perform a Kähler deformation. Some of the original collapsing uh, cycles have now disappeared from our new geometry. And in the limit, where it goes all the way to infinite volume, we get some other uh, singularity. So that's the setup in terms of uh, what we'll be studying with uh, RGM. Uh, any questions about that? 
Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the other ingredient which is going to enter into the analysis of these uh, fixed points and their flows, t brains So the standard F theory paradigm is we break down, at least locally, some virus stress model uh, like this, and we have a, a well-defined elliptic vibration away from the discriminant. This defined uh, where we have the discriminant like this, and we look at the vanishing of it. Along the components of the discriminant, it may be necessary to specify more structure, and it may not be purely geometric. This is simply because there are singularities, and in physics, whenever we see singularities, there can be ambiguities in reading off the physical theory. And we can find examples of these ambiguities also showing up in the geometry. So in physical terms, what we have <coughs> is uh, a gauge theory. And again, focusing on the case of six-dimensional theories. So the reason I'm calling it six-dimensional theory is because in F theory, your 10 space spacetime. So remember, we're in the string theory, so we have 10 spacetime dimensions. Your 10 space spacetime looks like the uh, complex surface, one compact times uh, six, uh, six uh, spacetime directions. <coughs> Uh, when we have a component of the discriminant locus, that fills out some curve inside of that phase. The reason for the name seven brain is because um, it fills out uh, precisely uh, seven uh, spatial directions, uh, which you can see here. Five spatial and two uh, spatial here. So seven refers to the number of spatial directions of the kind of object inside of the space. So whenever you see these uh, singular cadaver fibers, you're supposed to associate them with seven degrees, uh, as was already reviewed in the uh, previous talk. Um, now the fiber type plus monodromies, uh, as you kind of pass around the uh, discriminant, can, it dictates what kind of gauge group you get. And the vacua that you get uh, for the resulting six-dimensional theory is controlled by a field theory that lives on the components of the discriminant. So uh, what you get as that field theory is uh, at generic points described by a Hitchin system, and at basically marked points of this uh, of the curves, the components of the discriminant locus, there's deformations away from just the pure Hitchin system, uh, basically dictated by the singularities of the corresponding Hitchin field. Um, <clears throat> you can do a similar thing in four dimensions, where instead of talking about Hitchin system defined over a Riemann surface or a curve, you instead have a uh, topological theory defined over components of the discriminant, which are now complex surfaces. You get uh, a Bob Witten system coupled to some uh, uh, co dimension, complex co dimension one and two uh, defect. So, generic points away from those, you get an equation, uh, equation something like this. And then again, this is modified and marked points, uh, marked points and curves of the uh, geometry. Okay, so the generic correspondence between the stuff that's going on along the components of the discriminant locus and then the Calabria geometry is that if we take Casimir invariance of the uh, this Higgs field that appears in both the Hitchin system, it's a 1 comma 0 form for the Hitchin system and a 2 comma 0 form for the Bob Witten system. It's a section of the canonical tensor with adjoint of a principal's G bundle. Casimir invariance of that thing translate to complex structure deformations of the Calabria. <coughs> and polynomies of the corresponding connection that you define on that surface uh, get interpreted in terms of deformations in the intermediate Jacobian. And this has been in some sense, proven in some cases. So it's, it's been proven in the case of a local curve of ADE singularities, uh, like these fellows here. Um, it's true, it, there appears to be evidence that it's true in the case of a non compact, a local Calabria fourfold. And there's evidence that it even extends to the case where you allow kind of singularities in the profile of the field, namely like marked points in the case of Hitchin and in the case of uh, wooden marked points and curves. <clears throat> okay, so that's the kind of generic correspondence that one expects. Um, and for example, you can unfold an E8 singularity, so this, to an E7 singularity by allowing a deformation like this. And here is the corresponding unfolding. So for example, you imagine that there's an E7 cross SV2 subalgebra inside of E8. This is taking values in the SV2 subalgebra, and then when it has a non trivial Casimir invariant, that Casimir invariant is epsilon, trace by squared is epsilon. That thing is that deformation parameter. And so what's been established is that there's a natural, there's a nice correspondence between things you do here and smoothings that you do over there. Now here's where the subtleties begin. Casimirs might vanish. There could be uh, what's called the Milpo and Cone in the case of Hitchin system. There's a corresponding analog for Bob and Witten. You can have, for, in fact, even in Hitchin's original paper, there was an example where he wrote down, as for he wrote down SU2 Hitchin system on a genus 2 curve, solved it, it was Milpotent. 
Where is this thing in the classical geometry? Nowhere, because epsilon is zero. So it looks like there's an ambiguity. Uh, this is very subtle because obviously the phi is non-zero here, but somehow we're trying to mash things to smoothing definitions. So what happened to all the data associated with that? So these are sometimes called in the, uh, uh, in the physics literature T-brains because they look locally like upper triangular matrices, T for triangular. Okay, so what do we do with uh, Casimir variance uh, variants that are vanishing? The claim is that it's visible as a limiting procedure. So basically we imagine starting with non-zero values for that smoothing parameter epsilon. In that limit, the extra data associated with having this thing on or off is tracked by the uh, intermediate Jacobian <coughs> of the uh, Flavia 3 form. Uh, and I'll just remind you that you know, with suitable choice of uh, structure, you can put it as basically H3 over the reals or H3 over the integers. Okay. So the idea is essentially that you can start at kind of smooth points, and then by taking various singular limits, start to recover kind of this uh, t brain data. So, for example, you start with this, still the thing is on, and what you track to detect that the fact that this is not really an E8 singular is something that is still being performed, is that something is happening with the intermediate Jacobian of the uh, body out. So this is the story for Calabio three-folds. For Calabio four-folds, there's a little bit more to specify. Uh, there can also be uh, what are known as like uh, primitive four-form fluxes switch on. Uh, the claim, uh, which has some evidence for it, uh, and more should hopefully be obtained soon, is uh, that actually the extra data that you need to specify the analog of this is captured by the building cohomology. So not just having intermediate Jacobian periods of these uh, <coughs> three-forms, but also some additional discrete flux data you might So the thing you're interested in is this, and it involves both flat bits of C3 as well as kind of curvatures of the Sorry, what, what's the intermediate Jacobian for a Calabia fourfold? Oh, it's still gonna it's still gonna involve this H3. So, oh, still, oh. so it's still it's still involving H3 of uh, so so um, in physical terms we're still talking about periods of the three point dimension. Okay. Uh, well, this is the only thing that I can make sense of. Perhaps this is not the correct model I say, but this is the only thing I can physically make sense of it, so. And did you give a physical explanation for what all this stuff is yet? Like, what, what does it mean to have these non-zero but null-potent Casimirs? Well, in the component of the discriminant locus, it's described in the gauge theory that lives over the component of the discriminant locus. So okay. The point is that this is just some, this is just some peak field from the perspective of the pitching system. The challenge is to track what happens to that thing <clears throat> in the uh, Calabria geometry. Because if I, so if somebody says, I'm going to give you an F-theory model, and here it is, they actually haven't done their job, because they haven't told you what region in moduli space they're at. So they also have to tell you what's happening with the you know, local behavior of public structure. They have to tell you, in other words, a neighborhood in moduli space. If they haven't told you that, they've not actually uh, unambiguously fixed the uh, physical model. Okay. So now what am I going to do? I'm going to combine these two notions of RG flows and T-brains and put them together and ask, what can I say about 60 flows using T-brains? Now, why should I expect that there's any kind of correspondence at all? Well, remember, in RG flows, what we're interested in is these kind of limiting behaviors where basically all distance scales have washed away. So in other words, things have gone from short to long distances, and by the time we're done, there are no mass scales left. Similarly, when we're talking about T-brains, we're doing a very limiting operation. And when we go from something that looks like it has a lot of structure, something that has absolutely no structure left over, uh, in terms of showing up in things like uh, Casimir. So this is kind of the naive reason to expect there should be some kind of link between RG flows and T-brain deformations. Okay, so finding the fixed points. That's already been done uh, for 60 CFTs. And what I want to do now is find the fixed points. Between them. So what I'm going to do is review how it was that we found all the fixed points, namely the canonical singularities for the uh, electric fiber glad we have three folds. And then I want to tell you about kind of the progress that's been made, kind of uh, classifying all the types of flows that go between deformation between those phenomenal singularities. Okay, so let me begin with this. Uh, so again, uh, in the time scale of physicists, this is ancient. Um, so uh, back in 2012, uh, Morrison and Taylor helpfully showed us uh, how to think about uh, elliptically fiber glad three folds. And essentially, the point is that for elliptic uh, Calabria threefold, there's these building blocks we can use uh, for generic values of the complex structure, so all, all smoothings have been taken care of, which allow us to build up kind of generic uh, bases 
And then from those, uh, basically specify a base with these kind of curves. And it's here, this is a minus n curve, minus 3, minus 2, minus 2, minus 3, minus 2. Um, sorry, this is not the usual way in algebraic geometry to write it, but this is how I'm going to write it. Uh, and you can also have various intersections between those uh, curves, which build up higher radicals. So for example, you can have cation or four star fibers and having them intersect uh, with minus one, minus three, minus one, and so on, to produce bigger and bigger structures. So basically, these are the building blocks to make uh, all the non-compact elliptic uh, property L3. Here's the surprise. When you talk about canonical <coughs> singularities, there's actually uh, a rather strong constraint on the kinds of things that can happen. So I remind you that uh, to make a canonical singularity in this case, the main condition is that you look for a configuration of curves. <coughs> and the main condition you demand is that this uh, adjacency matrix defined by the intersection form, you demand that that is a uh, negative definite. So essentially the combination of a negative definite condition on the tractability of all the curves in the face plus the condition that you have an elliptic vibration at all uh, is quite constraining, and it turns out that uh, this is basically the kinds of configuration. So here, each of these little circles, these blue circles, corresponds to a minus n curve, or n can range from uh, <clears throat> minus 1 to uh, minus 12. These little links here are associated with the things I was calling radicals. They themselves are composed of intersection uh, uh, minus n curves. And so the whole point is that there's a single kind of chain of things with a small amount of decoration on the right and a small amount of decoration on the left. Um, and it didn't have to be this way. If I had just asked you, tell me about all the negative definite matrices that you could write down, it would be a wild proliferation of possible graphs that you could write down. The point is that the elliptic vibration condition constrains these further. Okay. So what we wanted to do is start with geometries like this. So this is really describing for me a configuration of collapsing curves. And then from this, we're going to ask uh, what kind of deformations we can do. <clears throat> so find flows between the fixed points. So there's two kinds of deformations you can do. And pictorially, here's what they look like. So a Kähler deformation corresponds to taking one of the curves and making it infinite in size. So in the, when we try to reach the canonical singularity, we take that curve and we try and collapse it to zero size. You can also do the reverse, try and see what happens when it goes to infinite size. So pictorially, I will denote that either by a, by a circle going to basically a square. There's also curves in the links here, and you can do the same thing where you replace those by kind of big non-compact object. There's another thing you can do, which is smoothing deformations. Um, so basically there's a collision here and here, there's a localized deformation here, and if you turn it on, you basically rejoin components of the discriminant. Uh, and this is the other kind of thing that the, generically, or is the other thing that can smooth uh, the formal flow. Okay, so these are sometimes called, uh, or these are called tensor branch flows. <clears throat> what are you doing in that TQFT that I was talking about on the discriminant? It corresponds to switching on sources. Uh, so here we had, in the original Hitchin system case, we had bell bar phi equals zero. Here you basically have two coupled Hitchin systems, one for each component of the discriminant, and there's some singularities for the fields at marked points where they, the two components collide. <clears throat> okay. So there's a residue for this phi. So let me write it out, this phi locally, Looks like, uh, so Z is a local coordinate on the curve. Looks like uh, at some mark point Z P times a residue. You see. And if you take del bar of that, that's what I mean by this delta function. <clears throat> okay, now here's an interesting thing. Remember that the no potent ones were the ones that we uh, said were going to be associated with kind of these singular limits where there was nothing, uh, there were no distance scales left. We expect that if the, um, this residue is nil potent, that we start triggering flows to new CFPs. And as has been appreciated for some time in the context of just nil potent orbits inside of uh, Lie algebras, so orbit here just means adjoint action conjugation on um, a given nil potent element in the complexified algebra. <coughs> There's an inclusion of orbits, and that implies a corresponding ordering on the corresponding CFTs. So in other words, there's this algebraic thing we have, which is that you have no potent elements, and if you look at the orbit, sometimes it happens that the orbit, or the closure of the orbit, uh, contains another orbit. Here's a contextual plane that basically, in the physical theory, each of these no potent orbits defines for you the corresponding fixed point. And in fact, the partial ordering, which is known for 
the milk oven cone, this thing over here, this is just a mathematical object, no physics in it. That partial ordering implies a partial ordering on physical theories. <clears throat> so can we match that RG flow, uh, R, those RG flows to a partial ordering? And which set of views goes with a given Calabian 3 flow? So here's the general picture. It's basically two steps. Uh, it appears that everything comes from two stages of uh, one step of fission and then one step of fusion. So basically you start with a simple set of progenitor canonical singularities. From them, you break them apart, do some smoothings, and then you might try to rejoin them back together. And this appears to describe all the fixed points or all the canonical singularities that uh, we've already found. Okay, so what does efficient deformation look like? You first perform some Kähler deformation, namely turn one of those circles into a square or cut one of the links and have that thing expand. And then you perform some smoothings, uh, both on the left and right of this one and on the left and right of this one. <clears throat> Fusion is where you take a single non or something that looks like a non-compact P1, make it compact, and then take the extreme limit where that compact P1 is actually collapsing to zero size, and thus makes a worse uh, canonical singularity. So here's the claim. Every 60 CFT, namely every canonical singularity that we have for these elliptic Calabia threefolds, is obtained via fission of some small set of progenitor theories, which I'll tell you about in a moment or from uh, one step of fusion from the fission products of those progenitors. <clears throat> Here are the progenitors. So what are these? Um, so essentially each circle here is a minus two curve, up, except over here is a minus one curve. Here, <clears throat> you have an ADE algebra associated with the corresponding Kodaira fiber type as dictated by uh, what I already told you about earlier, namely those Kodaira fiber types tell you about gauge groups, et cetera. Here, these are the radicals, so these themselves evolve configurations of curves that must be introduced to blow the thing up and put it in Weierstrass form. Over here, we have some non-compact E8. The claim is that these are all the progenitor theories you need, and everything else kind of drops out from these. So I will call these things complex deformations. The reason is they're complex structure deformations in the Calabiao, but they appear to have some non-trivial algebraic structure uh, attached to them. So if you see uh, a configuration like this with a square next to a circle, this can happen on either the left or the right. There's a mirror reflection of this. <clears throat> if you see a minus 2 curve next to a square like this, then you talk about homomorphisms from SU2 to GL. What's the reason for that? Well, I remind you that every time somebody hands you a nilpotent orbit, you can actually form a homomorphism uh, of this type. The point is that uh, you have the original nilpotent element, you have its conjugate, and then you have its commutator. And so this gives you, this implies, an SU2 inside of wherever these things were defined. So this is inside some algebra. <coughs> that defines for you, <coughs> if you like some SL2C, inside of GC. So, yeah. so given a notebook and element from Jacobson and Morozov, we know that you build up these kind of homomorphism just from the start. So based on physics, what you expect is that every time somebody hands you a nilpotent orbit, that's a T-brain, we expect to be able to match that to particular kinds of deformations of the cloud Yaus associated with canonical singularities. And here's the, here's the corresponding deformation. Another class of things that happens, you don't have a minus 2, you instead have a minus 1. <clears throat> I don't really have time to explain it, but there's a small refinement you can do uh, in this case. And uh, again, based on physical arguments, one can argue that in this case, where you have the minus one curve, there's a slight refinement which occurs, which is that you have instead a finite ADE subgroup of SU2, and then you look at group homomorphisms from that finite subgroup into the A. <clears throat> so in other words, each time you look at one of the smoothing deformations involving one of these things, there is a corresponding homomorphism over here, and vice versa. So essentially, the way we did this is by brute force, which is through and check all possible things, uh, and it seems to uh, match up. Okay. It does match up. Okay, <laughs> so there's a known ordering on the nilpotent uh, on the nilpotent orbits in the case of the kind of continuous homomorphisms, SU2 into some of the algebra. What's unknown is whether there's a corresponding order in the case of the finite group homomorphisms, in this case here, for ADE subgroups of SU2. So I'm going to mainly focus on the case that is at least understood. There seems to be kind of a 
physical arguments for why to expect such a partial ordering, but apparently it's unknown. Okay, so here's an example. Decompactify the minus one curve. So here we had a circle. I'm going to replace it by a square. Then this thing breaks apart. That's the first efficient step. It breaks apart into two pieces in the limit where this thing becomes infinitely big. So remember, circle, circle means compact. Square means non-compact infinite body. So this thing breaks apart into two pieces. And now I'll apply my complex deformation, my thing labeled by a no-code orbit, over here or over here, or both. So what happens? Further spoofs the complex structure definitions. OK, so just to convince you that we actually did something non-trivial, you, <coughs> you can take one of these things. And here I've listed all of the partitions, for example, the Lie algebra uh, SOA. So these no potent orbits are labeled essentially by particular partitions of eight. They're, you should see this as basically taking a no potent element, imagine putting it in Jordan normal form. It's a corresponding uh, partition of eight. And there's various conditions you have to put on that partition for it to really describe a, a, an element of, uh, for the orbit inside of uh, SOA. So here are the corresponding geometries associated to each one of these no potent uh, orbits. And you can see that there's a corresponding network of flows, and we can actually deform between each of these going down for SOA. So that's just SOA deformations on the left. And you can do a similar thing on the uh, uh, right. Here it is for part of E6. Again, these things aren't really labeled as conveniently by um, partitions. Instead, they're labeled by what are so-called valid order labels. Again, the no potent cone is completely known. So you just list them all, and you can start matching them to sort of corresponding deformations of the geometry. So in other words, every nilpotent element defines for you one of these Calabi-Yau's, and moreover, the ordering of those nilpotent <coughs> elements corresponds to an ordering on the smoothings that you do as you go from very singular to uh, less singular. Here's the last little bit that didn't fit on the page. As you can imagine, E7 and E8 are harder to display. OK, so here's a rough sketch of how you can classify the flows as you go from singular to non-singular. Start with the progenitors, do some fission, now, it turns out that not every single canonical singularity we get can be put in this form of starting from here and flowing down. Instead, you break it apart, and you take two of those broken apart pieces, or more, and start trying to fuse them back together to produce the rest of them. This is, right now, the weakest part of completing the classification, uh, but at least it's uh, going in the right direction. OK, so that is <coughs> it for 60 flows. Now I'm going to move on to asking whether a similar structure survives for four-dimensional flows. So remember, those are supposed to be associated to Calabia fourfolds and canonical singularities in there. I'm going to take the Miles example, where it's not really a modest Calabia fourfold. I'm going to just basically work on T2 compactifications on Calabias. So in other words, there's a chain of dualities you can apply uh, to talk about F theory on T2, corresponding to S1, M theory on this, corresponding to 2A on the same Calabia threefold. And that's very interesting uh, <clears throat> for us. So we're just basically going to look at these models. So in other words, your internal geometry is now T2 cross B2. So now your 10-dimensional geometry is four-dimensional space-time. <clears throat> so I'm going to focus on something even simpler, like one of these things where we have a collision of, say, one component of the discriminant and another one. At the collision point, we don't demand that the fiber is in cadaver form. <clears throat> so for example, we will allow ourselves to talk about collisions of 2d8s, 2d7s, 2d6s, 2d4s. And we'll refer to this as formal matter. Uh, the reason for matter is that essentially collisions of components of discriminant are typically associated with matter. And it works the same way here. OK, so the main example for today will be this little nub. And if you go down on a T2, what you should expect is an N equals 2 CFP <coughs> with a corresponding left-right flavor symmetry. What do we know about this theory? We don't know a Lagrangian description for it. But what we do know, for example, is that it contains uh, dimension 2 operators uh, transforming in the adjoint representation of the left flavor group and adjoint value operators in the right. So there's two kinds of flows we might consider doing associated with nilpotent uh, no public elements of an algebra. One is associated with moduli flows. <coughs> so we have these operators that are valued in the adjoint. I can switch on a no potent bev for these. <coughs> if you do that, you, know, you should expect to kind of stay in the kind of n equals 2 world. Uh, not too much is to say there. What we're going to focus on instead is these deformations. Uh, sorry, so you can already do these kind of things. 
Uh, he, in fact, already did those. <clears throat> those are already covered by the things we already talked about. These things, on the other hand, deformations where you kind of perturb what you mean by correlators in the uh, field theory, are interesting because they aren't uh, tracked by the complex structure deformations. Instead, they're associated with deformations connected with the uh, intermediate Jacobian of the fourfold, namely the periods of this uh, uh, threefold. <clears throat> so, in other words, the, the, it kind of the mathematical object is very similar. It's still a non-potent thing, but it's telling you something different about the underlying uh, geometry. In this case, it's not really a full gladi hours instead of talking about uh, T2 cross gladi uh, threefold. So, so, what I'm going to do is tell you about deformations of this thing via these kinds of operative geometry. So again, there is a partial ordering on these nilpotent elements. And from this, uh, one finds a network of n equals 1 now, supersymmetric at the pole field theory. Um, the thing I was telling you about uh, previously in six dimensions had eight real supercharges. These have uh, four real supercharges. OK. There's also a flipper field or deformations. Uh, these essentially amount to promoting the background values to expectation values of background fields. And you get another set of n equals 1 CFTs. So out of these nilpotent elements, you can actually define three different kinds of things you could do in terms of flows. Moduli space <laughs> flows, relevant deformations, as well as kind of flipper field deformations. So even though these lead you to very different looking theories, uh, it turns out that the kind of connectivity of which partial orbit connects to another partial orbit all follow the same kind of uh, topology, which is uh, pretty non-trivial. OK, so you do this, and you find basically the same network of flows. The details of those individual fixed points are quite different. Uh, but I'm not going to get into so many details of that. I just want to focus on a few kind of curiosities about them. So you can calculate, for example, the scaling dimensions of the operators. <coughs> and what you find is that they're generically uh, algebraic numbers. So A and B are positive <coughs> reals generically. In fact, they're positive uh, rationals. It turns out that if you go over, if you sweep over the snow plug in the cone, you sometimes find numerical accidents occurring where they're not just generic algebraic numbers, they're actually rational numbers. And there's not really a great explanation for why this is always happening. It seems to happen even when there is no enhancement in supersymmetry in kind of at very long distances. So it still is a bit mysterious. There are some examples that are understood where when this occurs, they will be in the rational numbers, but there seem to be other examples where it's becoming a rational number, but there is no expected enhancement. So it's kind of mysterious. It's an interesting numerical uh, curiosity that occurs. Another numerical curiosity that occurs is, um, so there's these things that we can do to uh, measure the degrees of freedom as we go from short to long distances, numerical quantities A and C. And if you fix a starting point in the, uh, at short distances and you consider all possible deformations, the values of a particular ratio of these things, A over C, is roughly constant. Uh, and this agrees with something that was found uh, for a completely different set of theories. It's not totally clear why this is happening. So here, for example, is a list of A over C. This is what A and C look like as you plot all the different definitions. So I should say that each of these data points is hard to get. And basically, you take a nilpotent element over here and a nilpotent element over here, and you repeat, and you grind it out. Or I don't grind it out. Uh, Thomas grinds it out. Uh, uh, for all of those cases, to find the corresponding fixed point. Uh, so it's a lot of, uh, it obviously requires a, a huge amount of uh, effort to then uh, find it all. And what you get is just these uh, <coughs> straight lines. It's not really well understood. OK, so what did I tell you about today? I told you about nilpotent orbits, namely uh, their relation to t-brains, t-brain deformation, and their relation also to uh, canonical singularities and the resulting uh, fixed points, RG, fixed points of RG flow that you get. What we saw is that the nilpotent cone that you just defined in terms of elements of a Lie algebra uh, leads to some non-trivial ordering of the fixed points, namely a corresponding ordering of the canonical singularities for uh, threefolds. Um, this is interesting because it suggests that there's probes that we can do uh, also for not just 6D, but also for 4D, for probes of, of T-brain structure, not just in complex structure, but also in kind of the its friends, the Deline cohomology. So uh, most of the work on T-brains is focused on deformations of complex structure. Here we're seeing kind of the same structure showing up in a different guise in four-dimensional theories. <coughs> uh, the intermediate Jacobian and the Deline cohomology. Future directions. 
Well, so one thing that obviously is being suggested by the physical uh, 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 interpretation, but is not really being completely uh, nailed down, is we saw a partial ordering for nilpotent orbits. Presumably, there is a corresponding ordering for uh, finite subgroups of SU2, uh, group homomorphisms of EA, that is still unknown. There's an object you can compute whenever you're given a for the uh, n equals 1 CFT, uh, super conformal index. This ordering on nilpotent orbits should imply some kind of partial ordering on full like partition functions, and there should be some very nice uh, uh, arithmetic associated with that, still completely unexplored. Are there interesting large-end limits for these 60 CFTs and their 4G descendants? And what happens with these local deformations? And a related question, if you consider uh, T-brain deformations in collab of 5 folds, a uh, natural question is, is there a corresponding hierarchy for uh, two-dimensional uh, theories? And they're about uh, large That's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Are there any questions? So, for research on, on T brain, is the definition of T brain something that is uh, not stabilized, so then it's a question of studying the property? Or you think that there is still uh, room for. Well, I don't think there was any ambiguity about what the definite question was, at least from the perspective of uh, components of the experiment. The question is, I think, more. Um, so, the way. Uh, I think one defines deep brains is you start with some smooth collabial, and then as you start degenerating the moduli, you will reach singular points in the moduli space. The point is that the T brains are in some sense completing the moduli space for you. So it's not really like saying what is the geometric version of the T brain. It's more where does what are the remnants or descendants of that T brain data once you go to the smooth point of the moduli space? That's really what, for example, the energy of Jacobian is that will track. Now, the thing that has not been done very much, it's only been done in a few examples, is actually tracking that limited behavior. Um, so the proposal, I think, is fairly fairly clear. There, there's a limit you're taking, and that's where the T-brain appears. The actual number of computations, for example, of limiting the spot structure in these limits that's been done is, there's like a handful of examples that have really been cleared out. So that's, I think, the place where there's definitely a lot to, uh, to do. So I think at least the proposal or the claim for what, what should happen is, or collabia three. Now, for Calabria fourfolds, um, this limiting behavior is not completely under control, at least from the physics side, because there can be various branches of moduli space, and you may not be able to take the limits you want to do. So that's, again, a complication. But at least at a philosophical level, it's, it's clear what it's meant. Yeah. Is that any other question? No. Uh, yeah. yeah. You conjecture the connection with the Linux homology. Do you have like a calculation that you just find it out and? match it one-to-one -one with like a limiting sequence in the performance picture? Well, so the simple thing that I can do is, um, you can actually even see it already in the 60 case. So, okay, so you're talking about the link homology over here, right? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> what is what is the silly thing I could do for you? Uh, I could consider instead what's happening, for example, just in the Hitchin system. So in the Hitchin system, right, uh, you have actually specify solutions, right? The things you would want to talk about are um, the choice of kind of a holonomy for the complexified connection. And you also want to talk about the kind of flux. So those are the two components. The holonomy is the kind of descendant down under the hitching curve. That, so you start with the periods of the three form. Imagine integrating uh, over a two cycle there. You get one cycle. That's the holonomy bit. And there's also a flux. So integrate again, you'll get some flux. That's, the, that's where this other piece is coming from. And so that's the level of checks which, which have been done kind of at a really precise level. Um, but these are basically the only ingredients that can go in. So it, it's one of these things where it, there's not much room to make that guess. So. Okay. Further questions? Is the decreasing of the A function has been checked during the proof analysis? Like yes. So, so, so the first thing we did is we, uh, uh, in fact, we were making various uh, kind of, it's very subtle to do this. So one of the things that uh, I didn't emphasize, but does happen is, uh, this slides is incredibly non-trivial, is as you flow down, a lot of operators start to decouple. 
Um, so various operators start to hit scaling dimension one, and then they leave the spectrum. Um, so what we did is we calculated A for each of the corresponding no-potent elements, taking into account the operators that we couple. And then once everything was taken into account, then we observed that the A is, is decreasing uh, as it should. Also, uh, C is, is decreasing. And it's, it's more non-trivial than that because you have to actually track like, a trajectory through the ordering of the orbits. Um, so the other thing I can say about that is the other reason why this is really non-trivial is as you start passing from one point in the cone down to the next, the, the way you get from one uh, IR theory to the next one is by a, a further deformation. In the process of doing that deformation, what can happen to you is this operator that you were using to perform the further deformation may have already left the spectrum. However, it appears that, well, we didn't do a completely systematic check of this, but it appears in all the examples where we can actually check it, these operators that are being used for the deformation never actually leave the spectrum. So, so that's the reason why it's, it's really not trivial before the A equals one case that the full network is actually surviving. It could have been that you take the, the no and cone, you start deleting things out, but that doesn't seem to be what's happening. Is there a formula for the change in A in terms of the orbit that you choose? Uh, so long as nothing drops below the unit of yes. When, so that's from actually our paper with uh, Eugene and Brian. Um, in the case where things drop below the unitarity bound, we have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis because you have to check which operators, and so you have to correct the value of the uh, infrared R symmetry on, on a case-by-case -case basis. So we don't have a close form expression for that. Um, so for example, that's part of the reason why we cannot give like an analytic proof of uh, this A over C ratio remaining completely constant. Um, so yeah, we don't know. This is in fourth year or something now? This is in fourth year. I'm talking about the 60, the download of the ATM. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, well, well, that Tom and I already kind of did by brute force. But I mean, is there any, in this context, is there anything related directly to the orbit structure? How much they decrease on that? Um, yeah, so uh, I don't remember the formula off the top of my head, but actually, um, uh, Thomas Yellow and Kremenisi, and uh, it kind of follows by uh, Tom Nathan. And those guys uh, did kind of put, write down close form expressions for how the conformal, how the anomalies of the CFT change uh, as a function of the kind of, uh, behavior of those building forms. So, so that's, that's already been done. So, so in that sense, that's actually one of the other things that we kind of do in the efficiency part. You can basically just take that result and prove that A is just directly decreasing across the entire flow. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Would be inappropriate. So it would be inappropriate. Uh, you put these dots on the fusion, up, and you say that's where the delicate part goes. Can you elaborate? Uh, yeah, it's just that. Um, where the delicate is. The well, so, so, so the point is okay. So the point is that like ninety nine percent of the canonical singularities can be recognized as starting from a progenitor theory and breaking it down to this. Now. Uh, even in the case where we were classifying the elliptic uh, cases, we found cases that didn't look exactly like this. Those are the ones that typically are hard to realize as deformations of these progenitors. And so the delicate point is there's a lot of these outliers. I mean, even though you know 1% might sound small, there's still is lots of ways of gluing them together. And what we did find, though, is that all of them admit this thing that you can just start with these things and start sticking them together by P1. What we don't know is what are all the different possible ways of taking progenitors to do something together, et cetera. So for example, if I hand you a canonical senior, so you like chop out one P1 to get back to a progenitor, what are all the possible ways of getting down to something, uh, to getting down to one of these fission products? This we don't know, and that's why the classification is a, a little bit more delicate than the Okay, thank you.